Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at mobsters John D'Amato and Anthony Capo. Under the sway of Giovanni Riggi, who had considerable influence over him, D'Amato came to prominence as a well-liked and formally initiated member of the De Cavalcante crime family. His rise stood out because of the fascinating background that led him to become the boss of this infamous family. A choice was made by Giovanni Riggi, a powerful player in the criminal underground, that would have an impact on the entire mob scene. Riggi's decision to promote D'Amato to the role of family head was not entirely his own, it was made while being closely watched by none other than John Gotti, the ruthless head of the Gambino criminal family. This move signaled more than just a change in leadership, it was a statement of power and alliance in the ever-shifting dynamics of organized crime. D'Amato's appointment as head of the De Cavalcante family was not just a nod to his capabilities, it was a calculated maneuver that solidified the ties between two of the most influential crime families in the nation. Under D'Amato's leadership, the De Cavalcante family would navigate treacherous waters, balancing the intricate web of loyalties, rivalries, and ambitions that define their existence. His rule would be marked by cunning strategies, daring endeavors, and a relentless pursuit of power in the shadows of the criminal underworld. As the head of this notorious family, D'Amato would find himself at the epicenter of a world where trust was scarce, and betrayal was a constant threat. He would need to navigate the complex web of relationships, both within his own family and with the Gambino crime family, to ensure his survival and dominance in this high-stakes game. In the annals of organized crime, D'Amato's appointment as head of the De Cavalcante family would be remembered not just as a change in leadership but as a pivotal moment that reshaped the power dynamics of the Mafia. It was a move that underscored the enduring influence of figures like Riggi and Gotti and the intricate alliances that defined their world, where loyalty was a rare commodity and power was the ultimate prize. In the 1980s, following his promotion to the position of captain under the mentorship of Giovanni John the Eagle Riggi, D'Amato immersed himself deeply in extensive labor and construction racketeering endeavors. His collaborators in these illicit ventures were no less than renowned figures in the New Jersey underworld, namely Giacomo J. Camari and Girolamo Jimmy Palermo. D'Amato, hailing from the influential Elizabeth faction of the De Cavalcante crime family, swiftly forged alliances with other high-ranking members of his organization. Notably, he joined forces with Charles Big Ears Myrie and Gaetano Corky Vastola, key players in the realm of illegal gambling and loan sharking. This collaboration marked the fusion of formidable talents and ambitions within the criminal fraternity, as D'Amato and his associates worked tirelessly to expand their dominion over these illicit enterprises. Their presence cast a long and ominous shadow over the criminal landscape of New Jersey, solidifying their status as power players in a world where vice and secrecy ruled supreme. In the 1980s, under Giovanni Riggi, a major faction leader from Elizabeth, New Jersey, a young man by the name of Anthony Capo joined the De Cavalcante crime family. In addition to loan sharking, Capo engaged in extortion. Three children and a spouse were raised by him. Capo pursued his certification as an asbestos abatement worker in the 1980s by enrolling at a school. Capo, however, claimed in a subsequent deposition that he dozed off in class and let the test be administered by a school employee instead of him. I wouldn't know asbestos if I were sitting on it, Capo said when asked by a federal prosecutor how much he knew about asbestos removal. Capo was listed by the police as a member of the De Cavalcante family sometime in the late 1980s. In 1989 it was challenging for both Anthony Capo and John D'Amato. First Capo who became entangled in a deadly conspiracy orchestrated by none other than John Gotti, the infamous boss of the Gambino crime family. Their target was Fred Weiss, a Staten Island, New York developer and newspaper publisher. Weiss had drawn the unwanted attention of federal authorities due to his involvement in the illegal dumping of medical waste. For Gotti, this posed a dire threat, he feared that Weiss might flip and become a government witness, unleashing a storm of trouble upon the criminal empire he ruled. As a gesture of loyalty and a favor to Gotti, the de Cavalcants agreed to eliminate Weiss. On that fateful day, September 11, 1989, Capo played a pivotal role in executing this macabre plan. He chauffeured two fellow de Cavalcante mobsters, Vincent Palermo and James Gallo, to Weiss' apartment. With chilling precision, Palermo and Gallo confronted Weiss just as he was entering his car. In a gruesome act of violence, they shot Weiss in the face, sealing his fate and silencing the threat he posed to their criminal enterprises. With the deed done, Palermo and Gallo re-entered Capo's car, and he drove them away from the murder scene, leaving behind a trail of darkness and secrets that would haunt their criminal careers. This harrowing episode would stand as a grim reminder of the lengths to which these mobsters were willing to go to protect their interests and maintain their code of silence. 
It was a chilling testament to the power of criminal alliances, where loyalty was enforced through bloodshed, and where the consequences of betrayal were measured in lives extinguished and secrets buried deep in the underworld's treacherous soil. Following the indictment of longtime boss Giovanni Riggi on labor racketeering and extortion charges in late 1989, Gaetano Corky Vastola assumed the role of acting boss for the North Jersey Mafia during Riggi's trial. During this period, a significant power struggle unfolded as John Gotti, the rival boss of the Gambino crime family, attempted to exert control over the Cavalcante family. One of the individuals Gotti reached out to was D'Amato, who reportedly collaborated with Gotti and his underboss Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano in a conspiracy to assassinate Vastola. Gotti was subsequently convicted of this conspiracy, shortly thereafter, Riggi was also convicted of his charges and received a 15-year prison sentence in 1990. Vastola continued to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the family. However, following Riggi's conviction, Vastola himself faced significant legal troubles, including major extortion charges, resulting in an eight-year prison sentence. While behind bars, Riggi appointed D'Amato as the acting boss of the De Cavalcante crime family. By the turn of 1990, Capo found himself deeply embedded in the criminal operations of John D'Amato and the reputed Captain Anthony Rotondo. Together, they orchestrated a web of illicit activities, ranging from labor racketeering to illegal gambling, extortion, and loan sharking, casting a long and dark shadow over the underworld. But Capo's influence extended beyond New Jersey's borders. He managed a De Cavalcante crew right in the heart of New York City, where opportunities for organized crime abounded. Between 1986 and 1994, he also formed a lucrative partnership with reputed Gambino crime family mobster Joseph Watts. Together, they ran a loan sharking racket that reportedly raked in more than a staggering $12 million. However, the criminal landscape was anything but stable. In 1990, Giovanni Riggi, the long-standing boss of the De Cavalcante family, found himself indicted for labor racketeering and extortion. In a move to maintain the family's leadership, Riggi appointed Gaetano Corky Vastola as the new acting boss. This was a short-lived transition because in the same year, Riggi was convicted and handed a 15-year prison sentence. The tumultuous nature of mafia life didn't spare Vastola either. In 1990, he was himself convicted on extortion charges and sentenced to a harsh 20-year prison term. In light of these developments, Giovanni Riggi made a pivotal decision, elevating Capo to the role of acting boss of the De Cavalcante crime family. This move marked a critical juncture in the family's history, as Capo assumed the reins of power in a world where treachery and loyalty were often separated by a thin line, and where leadership changes often came at a steep price. In January 1992, Capo was involved in a shocking turn of events within the De Cavalcante crime family. The victim was none other than the acting boss at the time, D'Amato. The seeds of this dark episode were sown earlier in 1991 when a heated argument between D'Amato and his girlfriend took a sinister turn. Seeking retaliation, she disclosed to Anthony Rotondo that D'Amato was actively bisexual, recounting explicit encounters in Manhattan's secretive sex clubs involving both men and women. Rotondo wasted no time in sharing this potentially damaging information with key figures in the family, namely underboss Giacomo Amari and consigliere Stefano Vitable. As Capo later testified in court in 2003, their collective sentiment was clear, they believed that having a homosexual boss discussing La Cosa Nostra business would undermine the family's standing and respect within the criminal hierarchy. In addition to the concerns about D'Amato's sexuality, suspicions ran deep that he was under the influence and control of John Gotti, the notorious boss of the Gambino crime family. Fueled by these apprehensions, the three men, Amari, Vitable, and Rotondo, made a grave decision. They ordered D'Amato's execution, entrusting this grim task to Capo, alongside Vincent Palermo and James Gallo. What made this act even more extraordinary was that it violated fundamental Cosa Nostra rules regarding the killing of a family boss. They didn't seek permission from the Mafia Commission in New York, a brazen move that underscored the gravity of their decision. On the fateful day of the attack, as D'Amato, Capo, and the other two hitmen got into D'Amato's car en route to lunch, the plot reached its deadly climax. From the back seat, Capo fired four fatal shots, ending D'Amato's life. After the execution, Capo and Rotundo left D'Amato's lifeless body at a secure hideout, where fellow mobsters disposed of the remains. D'Amato's body was never recovered, leaving behind an unresolved mystery in the criminal world. Giovanni Riggi, imprisoned at the time, was informed of D'Amato's assassination. In response, he appointed Giacomo Amari as the new acting boss, marking yet another dramatic shift in the leadership of the De Cavalcante crime family. 
In December 1999 marked a pivotal moment in the life of Capo and the de Cavalcante crime family's leadership. They found themselves facing a formidable indictment, encompassing a litany of charges ranging from labor racketeering and extortion to loan sharking, murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. Capo was specifically charged with some deeply serious offenses, including the 1989 murder of Fred Weiss, the 1992 assassination of acting boss D'Amato, and alleged involvement in two additional murders. The weight of these charges threatened to consign him to a life behind bars. Faced with the prospect of a life sentence for these heinous crimes, Capo made a dramatic decision. He chose to cooperate with the government, becoming a crucial government witness in the process. His testimony would not only incriminate members of the de Cavalcante family but also reveal the inner workings of organized crime that had long remained shrouded in secrecy. As a government witness, Capo provided critical testimony against not only members of his own family but also other crime figures, including Colombo crime family boss Joel Cacas and Genovese crime family Capo Federico Giovanelli. His cooperation unveiled the extent of criminal activities and the intricate web of connections that define the mafia's operations. Moreover, Capo's revelations extended beyond the criminal underworld. He uncovered a shocking breach of security within the Manhattan office of the U.S. attorney. It was revealed that a stenographer working there had been passing sensitive information, including lists of suspects, to Federico Giovanelli, a revelation that sent shockwaves through law enforcement and the criminal underworld alike. In the end, Capo's decision to cooperate would have far-reaching consequences, impacting not only the de Cavalcante family but also exposing vulnerabilities within the justice system itself. It was a turning point in a life marked by crime and secrecy, where survival often depended on making the most treacherous of choices. On January 23, 2012, 52-year-old Anthony Capo passed away from a heart attack. The Government Witness Protection Program covered him and his family. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.